I want to read a story to you. And I came across this story today, uh, this week, and um, I think it's a cool story. Three guys, they were being interviewed to be detectives at a police department. And the final step of the process is that the chief inspector says, um, uh, so you guys want to be detectives, um, you need to do a perception test. So these guys have got to do a perception test as the sort of <coughs> first part of the journey. So he calls them into his office one by one. The first guy goes in and he gets shown a picture of a recently captured criminal. He's got a tattooed face, a large scar. He's quiet, easily recognisable. And the inspector says to him, take a close look and I want you to memorise and remember all the features that are going to help you identify this man in a crowd. After about a minute, the man's done. The inspector turns the picture over and he says, well, go on, I want you to describe him to me. And the man says, well, it wouldn't be hard to find this guy given that he's only got one ear. The inspector turns the picture back over and goes... Hang on a second, what sort of moron are you? It's a side profile picture of the guy. Oh, get out of my office, you're never going to make detective. And he kills, kicks the guy out and the guy leaves. So he calls the second guy in. And the second guy comes on in, he gives him the exact same challenge, same picture, same deal. And after about a minute, the guy goes, well, I couldn't really focus on much other than the fact that he's only got one eye. Oh, it's a side profile. You got, wow, what's happening to the police department? He ushers him out, kicks him out, says, get out of it. By this stage, he's a little bit frustrated, but he has to finish the task, so he calls the third guy back on in. The last guy comes in, he's given the same challenge. The inspector says this, he says, you know what, I want you to, t- please, take five minutes, think very carefully before you answer me. Take your time and think. Five minutes later, the young man turns the picture over himself and he says, you know, I'll bet he wears contact lenses. The inspector scrunches his eyebrows and squints at the young man in silence for a few minutes and he doesn't want to embarrass himself so he excuses himself. He runs back to his office, opens up the filing cabinet, pulls out this man's profile and lo and behold, the guy wears contact lenses. So he's excited. He puts the file back in. He runs back in to the room and he looks at the guy and he says, well, actually he does wear contact lenses. How could you tell? Visibly delighted with himself, the young man beams back with a smile. He says, oh, it took a while to think of it, but there's no way he could wear regular glasses with only one eye and one ear. (laughs) If you've got a Bible there, turn with you 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. Perception is people's reality. Who knows that? Perception is everything. Uh, What you think, your perception of things, becomes your reality in the way that you interact with that particular reality. We've been talking about discipleship for the last uh, uh, few weeks, and we're going to continue on and look at what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, what he intended for discipleship to be. Last week, we started with a very tough saying of Jesus. It was when Jesus said to the uh, rich young ruler, Go, sell everything, and give it to the poor. Sell everything, give it to the poor. So we unpacked that. If you weren't here last week, jump on our Arise online YouTube channel. You can have a look at that. The good news is this. All of you, if you have wealth or material possessions, Jesus is not telling you to sell everything and give it all away to the poor. So you can relax. I'm not saying that. Uh, Jesus said that to that particular guy for one profoundly theological reason. And what was it? He asked exactly. It was an answer to this particular guy's question at the time. So we don't all need to go out and do that. But even though we don't all need to run out and sell everything and give it to the poor, does that mean that when it comes to finances that a disciple should just simply hoard for himself and look after numero uno? I want to just tell you something that Paul wrote to Timothy. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, it says this. It says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now I want you to understand something. Nowhere in the Bible, how many of you have heard people say this? Money is the root of all evil. Who's ever heard that phrase? Money is the root of all evil. And, and the presumption there is that if you've got money, then you're knocking on the doorstep of evil. Who's got money in this room right now? Hands up if you've got money. You, you're too embarrassed now, aren't you? Because you know you're evil. You know you're doing something wrong if you've got any money. Well, fortunately for you, that perception is way off target. Paul didn't say to Timothy, money is the root of all evil. He said the love of money, the love 
of money is the root of all evil. When we love something, we cherish it. When we love something, we give ourselves to it. When we love something, we chase it. When we love something, we desire it. When we love something, we're consumed by it. Money is not the root of all evil. It's the love of money (laughs) that's the root of all evil. Everybody can now go, Oh, it's okay that I've got a couple of dollars in the bank. It's okay that I've got a few things. Deuteronomy 8.18. Go back to the Old Testament. And Moses wrote this. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. Isn't it good to know that your ability, I hate to break this to you, but your great ability to do whatever it is that you do and to be the smartest and the best and produce, guess what? Yeah, yeah, you've worked hard and you've built on the talents God gave you. Good on you for that. But guess where it instigated? Guess where it started? It started with Him. It's God that gave you talents, abilities, wisdom, energy, ideas. It's God that gives to us the power to create wealth. So way back there, if God has created you and given you the ability to get it, doesn't it stand for reason that He's not going to then punish you and be angry at you if you use that power and generate it? Yep. So the love of money is the root of all evil. Money itself is not. In fact, God gives you the ability to generate income and to generate wealth. But I love the second part of that. He does it so that he may establish his covenant. So there's something about the generation of money that's not all about you. There's something about God inviting you. It's almost like God extends this invitation to us and says, I'm going to give you the power, the ability to create income and generate wealth because somehow through that, that's my invitation to you to be a part of me doing what I want to do and establishing my covenant here on planet Earth. Isn't that exciting? We get a chance to be invited into being a part of something God is doing through the use of that wealth and those things that we're able to acquire and to generate. So even though we're not all told to sell everything and give to the poor, it doesn't mean that on the other extreme, God's telling you, earn all this money in the world and think of nobody but yourself. And there's an extreme at both ends. And we want to live in the balance because it's in the balance that true disciples stand. It's in the balance that true discipleship happens. See, God loves you and he cares for you. Mother Teresa didn't sell everything and move to Calcutta just because she read a scripture verse one day that said she should. You know why she went? Because God spoke to her to do it. God told her to do it. So she she went and did what she did. People living in places like that, doing what they're doing, they're responding to God. And here's what I know. If you don't respond to God telling you to do it, you know what it ends up doing? You end up being critical. It's amazing. I was a part of a mission agency for many, many years. And in the last handful of years, I've heard stories of people that I looked up to in that agency that sacrificed the, the ability to climb the corporate ladder or do whatever it was in the world. They sacrificed that in order to build the kingdom of God. And these are wonderful, great people. But recently I heard a comment that one of them made. They looked back at their life now that they've stepped out of that. And they made this comment. They said, what was that all about? I gave all my life to that, and now I don't have a house. Well, I'd love to sit down with that person and go, I think you've got something wrong. Maybe God didn't tell you to do all that if the end fruit of it is you're going to be bitter and twisted about it. See, when God calls you to do something, there's a joy about it. There's a grace upon you to do it. And so if God's telling you to sell everything and give to the poor, there'll be a grace upon you to do it. So don't be an extremist to go and sell everything and move to China because Alan's been preaching on this and Alan told us we should. I'm not saying that to you. But at the same time, I'm not saying to you, sit back and just spend all your money on yourself, get faster cars, more houses, more... Cl- I'm not saying that either. What I'm saying is this. Disciples listen to God. A disciple will listen to Jesus. A disciple will hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to them because a disciple, when it comes to finance, understands at the end of the day, I've only got what I've got because you gave me the capacity to do it. God gives me the capacity. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, one of my favorite verses in the entire Old Testament. It says this, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that's written in it. What's he saying? Well, this is just discipleship, isn't it? We get into the Word of God. We, we hear the words of God. 
and we listen to what God has to say, and then we go and we do what God has to say. Is that, that's just basic discipleship. And then he goes on and he says, well, let me tell you the byproduct of that, the fruit of that, and here's what it is. It says that, that if you observe to do according to all, then you'll make your way prosperous and you'll have good success. So again, the byproduct of living the way God wants you to live will be prosperity and success. Now, don't jump on the word prosperity. Prosperity is not a million dollars in the bank. Okay? It's not just about money. And if you're hearing money, there's nothing wrong with my preaching. There's something wrong with your hearing. Because I'm not saying that. Okay? What I'm saying is this. The byproduct of getting into the Word of God, hearing what God has to say, and living it out, the byproduct of prosperity and success. God set it up that way. Don't get mad at me. God said, this is what I will do. Jesus reworked that in the story of the wise and foolish builder. I think it's Matthew 7. You know that story of the wise and foolish builder. What did Jesus say? He said, there were two men. And two men, and here's what they did. One man heard the words of Jesus and went and did it, And he's like a man who built a house on a rock and the storms came and the house stood firm. What is he saying? He's saying he's a man that meditated on the word of God day and night to observe, to do all that was written in it. And at the end, he was prosperous and had good success because it's a byproduct of walking as a disciple. Who was the other man? It says that he heard the words of Jesus, went and built a house, but it says he didn't do what Jesus said. So he's sitting in church every Sunday hearing it, but he's not doing anything with it. He's not going to take the step of faith and go, okay, even if I don't get it, I'm just going to start doing it anyway because this is what Jesus says. I'm going to start lining my life up with what he teaches, with his values, with his... I'm just going to start doing it anyway. He said, no, I just want to know the stuff. And then he went and did his own thing, and what happened? His house collapsed. It was like a home built on a sand, and great was its fall. So Jesus is is giving us in the New Testament the same principle. Live by what I'm telling you to do and your house is going to stand firm upon a rock for all the world to see. See, God loves us and God has no problem with us having things and money. He has a massive problem with things and money having you. God wants you to have things and money. Because God wants to establish his covenant here on earth. So if God wants to get something done that requires finance and things, who's he going to give the money to? Who's better than to give it to you to get it through you? I don't know all the great CEOs of the world. I don't know the guy that started Chicken Mania. Not personally. But the guy that started Chicken Mania, if I checked out his bank balance, is he putting anything into building the kingdom of God on earth? I don't know. I'm not saying he is or isn't. What I'm saying is this, I don't know. But I can look at Jeff and Karina Pinnock, who have got a a successful business, and I look at them, and do these guys generate income and put into the kingdom of God? You bet they do. You bet they do. And that's what a disciple does. A disciple factors God into that side of the world as well. I'm just going really quickly here. Let me, let me just give you uh, Luke chapter 12, very quick, verse 13 to 21. Luke, Luke, Luke 12, 13 to 21. It's a parable that Jesus shared, and it goes like this. One from the crowd said to him, Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus is preaching about discipleship to his disciples, and then this guy is part of a crowd, and he calls out, Hey, Jesus, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And so here's what happens. Jesus turns around and says, Hey, who made me a judge? I'm not here to deal with your uh, civil suits. This is what Jesus does. He says, no one made me judge, Arbiter. Take it, take it to the right people to sort with that. And then he turns around to his disciples and on the back of that statement, see, here's the thing, there was nothing wrong with what the guy requested, by the way. Tell my brother to give me my portion of the inheritance. The portion of the inheritance was his legal right. There was nothing wrong with him requesting that. Nothing wrong at all. Basically what's happened, we can deduce from here, is that the inheritance is, someone's passed away, the inheritance is getting divvied up. The elder brother probably got it all and it was his job to distribute it. The elder brother gets a double portion of inheritance. That's the way it worked in that culture. But he's holding on, he's not just getting a double portion, he's holding three, he's holding his other brother's part. And so this guy says, just tell him to do what's legally right. Nothing wrong with the request, but Jesus picks something up in his heart that's wrong. And Jesus uses this opportunity and he turns around And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentiful. I love that, because again, this guy's already rich. Does God bless the rich? I thought God only blesses the poor. 
Well, the ground of a certain rich man yielded even more. This guy was rich, and you know what God did? He blessed him more. How do I know that? Because when people talk about soil and ground, the Jewish people understand that God uses the ground, blesses and curses through the soil of the land. So if this ground is producing bountifully, this man's being blessed by God. We would just say, oh, it was a bumper season. We got the rain. They would say, no, no, this is directly a blessing from God because God controls the seasons. God's blessing the earth. He's a rich man and God's blessing him. Nothing wrong with having things. Just don't let things have you. Nothing wrong with having possessions. Don't let them possess you. Jesus never at any point exalts poverty and poor people and puts down those that happen to have means because most, a lot of them that have means have got there because they've done the right thing. It's almost like God's schizophrenic. Some people think God's got schizophrenia problems. I'm going to bless you. You do the right thing, I'll bless you. You do the right thing, I'm going to bless you. Then on the other hand, I'm going to turn around and go, you evil sucker person, I'm going to now I'm going to take it off. What's going on here? And he thought within himself, now everyone, listen. He said, what shall I do? Say, I do. Since I have, say, I have. No room to store my crops, say, my crops. So he said, I will, say, I will. Do this, I will. Pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, you have many good years laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink and be merry. Who do you think he's thinking about? From start to finish, where do you think his mind is? Who's he concerned about from the very beginning to the very last thing he says? Who is he consumed with? Me, 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 me. It's all me. My barns, I will. I'm going to, I will. God, thank you, Lord, that you've blessed me bountifully. But now that you've blessed me incredibly, I'll take it from here, Lord. Thanks for giving it. I'll work out how to handle it. Thanks for the blessing. Now it's all mine. Me, 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 I will, I will. Me, 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 I will, I will. I love this next bit. But God said to him, Fool. Oh, that's a heavy one. That's a heavy one. Go back to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5. Jesus was very clear, don't you ever call anyone a fool. He's guilty of hellfire. You call someone a fool, you are guilty. That's how serious... He is about, don't use that term, don't speak that way to people. This is when he's talking about lust is not just the action, it's a thought. Murder is not just the action, it's hatred. In the same breath he says, don't call anyone a fool, yet here he is saying, but he's an exception to the rule. This guy is a fool. (sighs) Gives me chills. This night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things which you have provided? Who, then who, who, dyslexic. This night, your soul will be required of you, then whose will those things be which you have provided? So it is with he who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. Let me just leave you two quick thoughts. How do you not fall into the trap of loving money? I want to give you just two real simple things to think about. Number one, know what enough looks like. How many of you know what enough looks like in your life? How many of you know what enough money looks like for you to survive comfortably? See, we don't know. Here's the thing. We don't know what enough looks like because the world constantly tells us that we've never got enough. And so we live as if we've never got enough. So we work a second, a third job. We, we, we never have enough. And, and the problem is this. If you've never thought about what enough looks like, then how do you know you don't have it? How do you know you don't have enough right now if you don't know what enough is? If you don't know what enough is then you won't know what it looks like. So how do you know you don't have it? How do you know that point where we stop? You remember that James Bond movie years ago, The World is Never Enough? Remember that movie? The world. A lot of us live like that. The world is never enough. We could be given the world and we'd probably still be thinking, I still don't have enough. Hey, I'm not having to go to anybody. I'm just saying this. If we've never sat back and thought about what enough looks like, how do we know we don't have it? We live in a culture that says to you, you've never got enough. The world we live in says you never have enough. Never have enough. So if we're taking our cues from the world, we'll never feel like we have enough. We'll always need more. I wonder if we've ever stopped in our own world. Have you ever stopped and sat down and done a, a budget and thought, this is, this is what enough looks like. This is what enough is. 
without a son. By the way, this guy had a barn. Notice that? He had a barn. So God was okay. He's a rich man with a barn. It's like a savings account. And that was okay. There was no problems. He had a barn. And you know what you did the barn? The barn's all the stuff that's sitting there for another time that you don't need right now. It's like, imagine having a savings account in the bank. So if you've got a savings account with money in it, it's okay. It's good. It's wise. It's smart. But, 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 but notice what he did. He got blessed by God. He already had a barn there. He had enough. So what did he decide to do the minute he got blessed? I'll kick the barn walls down. And I'll make bigger barns so I can keep more for me, 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 me. Because it's all about me, 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 me. So he kicks the barn doors in and builds bigger. I wonder what happens next season when he gets a bumper crop again. What does he do? Well, he kicks the barn doors down and he makes bigger and bigger and bigger. Why? Because all he's thinking about is me. I, I will, I will. God's blessed you, man. At what point do you, do you have enough? At what point do we actually go, okay, that's actually enough for me, God. What do you want me to do with the rest? God, where can I put it? How can I be a blessing? How can I work with you to establish your covenant on planet Earth? Hey, a 2013 survey in America revealed this. The average man has 12 pairs of shoes in his cupboard. Who's the average man here? Any average man here? 12 pairs of shoes in his cupboard. The average woman has 27 27 pairs of shoes in your company. That's the average American woman, 27 pairs of shoes. The same company sent a follow-up survey to everyone they surveyed first and asked this question, how many pairs of feet do you have? Guess what? They all said one. They averaged one pair of feet per person, but 27 pairs of shoes. When is enough? Enough. And you know how it works. You can't just get shoes. And by the way, it's not just ladies here. Boys, boys are the same these days. Oh, these are really nice shoes. But now I don't have a shirt with it. So now I've got to go and get a shirt that matches. But, but, but if I get dacked at school, I better have matching boxes as well. So I've got to get matching boxes just in case. And then before you know it, all you started out was buying a pair of socks. And you've just spent $300 on a whole outfit. But you only needed socks. But the world says it's not enough. When's enough? Enough. The average man has six pairs of jeans. The average woman has seven. But statistically, they found that we only wear four of them anyway. So we've got three or four pairs of jeans in our cupboard, hands up, that you never wear. I've got jeans that I've never worn. When I found this survey, first thing I did is I went home and looked in my own cupboard. I couldn't believe it. I'm looking at these jeans going, do I know you? And they spoke back, yes, we met once at a cafe. You remember you took me home? Did my wife know about that? Well, she encouraged you. So it's her fault. Ah. Still got tags on them. It's outrageous. I'm thinking, what was I thinking at the time? You know what the problem was? I wasn't. At the time, I didn't think enough was enough. It's an interesting thing. I wonder in your world, have you ever thought about what's enough money? What's enough shoes? What, what, what's enough? I mean, break it down to any area of your... When is enough enough? You know, the average spend on kids' birthday parties, I, I got this from Business Insider, 2020 edition, uh, in January 2020, they said this, the average kids' birthday party, people spend between four to $500. On, an, on this is little kids. Four to $500 on a birthday party. Four to five hundred bucks on one birthday party for a child who probably has no idea what's going on. You could have just handed them an old newspaper <laughs> and a bag of chips. And they would that would be as memorable as your four hundred dollar party. Because they're not gonna remember it. They're too small. But it's got it, it's not enough. <sighs> In fact they found that the wealthy wealthy people will spend about fifty thousand dollars on the same party. There was one recorded case of a person spending $350,000 on a toddler's birthday party. When's enough enough? I hope the toddler doesn't remember it because he's going to feel really ripped off by the time he's 18. Unless you go $350,000, $400,000, $450,000, it's going to cost you a million bucks by the time he turns 21. So number one, how do we try to avoid the love of money? First thing, have a think about What's enough look like in your world? 
Have a think about what does enough look like. Second thing, and I'm, I'm wrapping up. Second thing here, be financially active in building the kingdom of God while you still can. What, what sparked Jesus saying to this guy, you're a fool? He said this, your life's going to be required of you tonight. Now that's, he would have known that. He, everybody knows they're going to be born, they're going to die. Everyone knows that. That's not rocket science. Jesus wasn't throwing something out there and the guy went, Who? Oh, you serious? <laughs> Thought it was eternal. It's what comes after that. Jesus says, your life's going to be demanded of you. And then who's going to have control of all that stuff that you piled up? In other words, you're in control of it now. If you want to make a difference for the kingdom, now's your time. It'll be too late then. How do you know, this is what Jesus says to me, how do you know the person that's going to get it all, how do you know they're not going to use it to build a drug empire? How do you know they're not going to use it to buy their 28th pair of shoes? How do you know? How do you know? While you're here, we've all got a chance. You know, see, there's something powerful. I, I, I only preach probably once a year in, in our gathering. I'll preach once a year on, on giving and, 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 and stuff. I only do it once a year. So this is not that time. But you know what? There's something powerful when you, when you go to your local gathering. And there are people here. I don't know you all. So I'm encouraging you to do this at your own gathering. There's something powerful about being in your own community of faith and financially giving towards whatever it is that God's laid on their heart. There's something powerful about that. There's a couple of things. Number one, you get to be a part of what's going on. Let me tell you what people that give here are a part of at the moment. You're a part of the success of this mother's thing that's about to kick off. You're a part of that because some of that finance will be used to make this work. It'll be used to, to, to bless these mothers. It'll be used to, to create... I mean, it's used to provide a facility that these ladies can come to. I mean, you're a part of that. Don't sit back and just think, I just throw money in there and it just, I just throw money in. No, no, you're a part of that. Everyone here, you're a part of that. If you give, you're a part of that. You, we had the men, gathered the men together the other night. And we had some guys there that don't know the Lord. Uh, Theo organised. You know what? When, when those guys come, everybody here that gives, you're a part of the fruit of that. That's a part of what you're a part of. Don't just think, I'll oh, just chuck money in. No, no, no. What goes on? What happened that night? You're a part of it. You can't be everywhere physically, but we can be bits and pieces of us go places by the giving that we do when we invest into the kingdom of God. You know, these cameras we've got up the back there, uh, we, we, we're just kicking this off. We're trying to go, go put a rise online. You know, we found people actually watch it. <laughs> Must be nothing else on, maybe. I don't know. But people are actually watching it in different parts of the world and different places. We're not doing this to make your life more comfortable. And by the way, I'm so excited that you're turning up because it would be easy to just go, oh, we're online now. I'll sit at home and do whatever. But you understand the importance of gathering together. Praise God, that's awesome. So, but, but you know what? Everybody that that's reaching, everyone that's hearing the word of God, that's fruit on your account because you're a part of that. We can't do that without what you contribute and what you give. So you're investing in the kingdom by doing that. So yeah, I'm glad someone's excited about it. I think it's awesome. Kids ministry, when those kids gather together, who loves it when the kids get to go out the back there and they're hearing the word of God in a language and a way they can understand? That happens, you know why? Because people like you and me, because we give. And so I can't physically be out there. It's not my thing, but I give. Ooh, as of two weeks ago, guess what? You are all kind of, I don't know what the term is. Uh, is it surrogate? Is that what you call them maybe? I don't know. Uh, look, uh, that word might mean completely something different than what I think based on your expressions right there. But anyway, guess what? We are now the proud participants in the raising of two children in Sri Lanka. As a church, as a gathering, we're sponsoring uh, two young kids. As soon as I get their profiles and that, we'll put them up and we'll, we'll put them here somewhere so everyone knows. And guess what? Your giving is going towards giving those kids in Sri Lanka a better life. Not just a better physical existence. These guys are, are, are hooked into a local church and they're hearing the message about the death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. We're not just meeting physical needs, we're meeting spiritual needs. Now, we're not in Sri Lanka. We can't go there, but our giving can. Our giving can. There's nothing... And, and the other thing, final thing when we give. Here's, here's the most powerful thing for me. When you walk up and you give or you press a button online, whatever it is, it's not just all of that stuff. That's wonderful. But here's what I love about it. You lose control of the dollar. You lose control of it. 
Now, I know some people that go, oh, I give, I just don't give to my local gathering. I give here and I give there and give there. Look, look, that's fine, you can do that. But one thing I'd caution you with, you're still in control of it. If you've got to stay that in control of it, it's probably still in control of you. There's something about releasing that, you call it a tithe, whatever it is, I don't care, I don't want to get into all that, but whenever you give, you release control of it. And each time you give, you release control of it, guess what, that thing releases control of you. Because money wants to control you. Money wants to consume you. Think about it. If the love of money is the root of all evil, and you're the devil... What's one thing you're going to work very hard on making happen in a person's life? If it's the root of all kinds of evil, I want you to love money. And I'm going to do things to make you love money because if I can get you to love money, hey, it's the root of all kinds of evil. Doesn't that make sense that that, that, that the enemy would want you to love it? God would want you to use it not be used by it. Jesus said to him in the end of that parable, he said, so is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. You know what's interesting about that word rich in the Greek where it says rich towards God? It literally means rich in possessions and abundance and things. It's, 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 it's talking about your material stuff. So you can be rich in worldly terms, laying up treasure for yourself. Being rich towards God doesn't mean being in poverty. Being rich towards God means being affluent, having stuff, but using it for God, not just for you. This man was a fool because he didn't factor God. Uh, uh, Psalm 14, I think, is verse 1. It says, a fool says in his heart, there's no God. A fool doesn't factor God into his human existence. A fool doesn't factor God into life in any way, shape or form. This man was a fool because when it came to his finances, guess what? He didn't think or factor God in in any way, shape or form. It was just all about him. So God, make it clear, God has no problem with your blessing and prosperity. In fact, he wants to bless you. He does. He doesn't have a problem with it. But he wants you to be wise enough to realise This is for me. Here's my barn. Here's my storehouse. That's enough. See, most people's kingdom giving doesn't begin until their enough ends. And that's a problem when you don't know when your enough ends. I'll leave you with this thought. I heard a preacher many years ago. I actually wrote it on the inside cover of my Bible. I've got all these little sayings I've picked up over the years that I've heard people say. And here's what he said. He said, the world and its possessions are at the feet of the man or woman that cannot be tempted. When God knows he can get it through me, I've got no doubt God desires to get it to me. Not to hoard up for me, but to use for his skin. So two practical things. How can you, what can you practically do to avoid the love of money? Number one, work out what enough looks like in your world. Work it out. And then whatever's above that enough, bring God into that space. Okay, God, you've blessed me with this. What, what do I do with it? And if you're here and you go to another gathering, can I encourage you? Would, you? would you consider giving to that particular gathering? Because they're doing things for the kingdom of God. Release control of just that little bit. Give it to them. Sow into what they're doing. Uh, because God's blessed you. Allow God to get it involved in the financial side of life. Amen? Father, I want to thank you for this morning, God. It's been an awesome, wonderful morning. And uh, Holy Spirit, I pray, would you continue to take us on this discipleship journey, Lord? We, God, we want you to be in the midst of every area of our life, Father. We want you to invade us. We're praying for a great move. I'm praying for a move of the Holy Spirit upon the hearts of every person in this place, Lord, that you would refine us, God, you'd sweep through us. Lord, you would bring all those areas of our life into alignment with who you are, your character, your nature, and in line with the plans and purposes that you have for us, Father. So thank you, God, each person here. Lord, I pray as we leave this place this morning, God, in the next seven days, give every single one of us here a chance to tell somebody out there about your goodness, Lord, somebody that at this point in time doesn't believe it. Give us that opportunity, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen.